Please be seated and welcome again to another uh, class uh, of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Teachers uh, Teacher Certification class. Glad you could make it tonight um, or this evening. Uh, for those of you that are here and those of you that are on the internet. Um, I understand that if you are on the internet, you should be able to go on there and download the actual book, um, or a copy of the book, if you will, so you could follow along and, and train. So tonight we're in the acceptance unit here on the overheads. That's what it looks like, the acceptance unit. And we've also, we also keep our character unit with us uh, for reference that we're going to and from. It's great to have that if you, if you do have one. And we left off on page 55. Before we start on page 55, though, let's go back to page 43 in our acceptance unit. Page 43, this is the beginning page. Just want to remind, just a reminder of where we're at and kind of what we've been through, just a quick overview. So this chapter is titled, Positive Communication Leads to Healthy Interactions. It, and the introduction here on page 43, I'm going to go ahead and read this introduction. It says, unless you are the only inhabitant on a deserted island, at least 90% of your day is spent interacting and communicating. So interacting, communicating, and consequently building relationships with others. Needless to say, most people do not live on a deserted island. <laughs> In fact, studies indicate that the majority of the world's population lives in cities. <clears throat> How we interact and communicate plays an important role in the quality of our relationships. Now, if you've ever said it, something that was misunderstood by someone, then you know the problems resulting from poor communication. Poor communication can cause conflicts, hurt feelings, and can convey an attitude of intolerance. In the previous chapter, we learned that intolerance in any form is negative and has the potential to cause resentment and animosity. Communication is vital to our lives if we are to be successful. We must learn how to communicate positively and effectively. Through positive communication, misunderstandings and conflicts can be avoided. In fact, how we communicate conveys our acceptance of those around us, and in this chapter, you'll learn that positive communication, interaction, and mutual res respect lay the foundation for all healthy and moral relationships. Okay. So let's go ahead and turn to uh, LP3E. LP3E, that's the lesson plan. It's on page LP, or lesson plan 3, page E. <clears throat> and if you look up at procedure number 7, now we've been through most of that, and currently we're about three-quarters of the way through page 55. So if you look about halfway down, in procedure number seven, it says, have students turn to page 55 in their handbooks and read and discuss the section entitled, Negative Selfish Relationships Hurt. Then we'll have students read the scenarios on page 56 and answer the questions that follow. Now, it's important to know the difference between a positive and negative relationship, and that's what we're looking at tonight. Um, you know, negative, selfish relationships hurt. We've been learning about building relationships. We've been learning about uh, how to listen and how to say what you mean. We've learned a little bit about how body language can affect our communication and even, the sp and even speaking. A relationship is only positive if both parties treat each other with respect and consideration. That's a positive relationship if both parties are working together to bring this forth. Let's go ahead and turn to page 55 then. 
and take a look at take a look at that. Okay, on page fifty-five, uh, just going back up to the top for a minute. Now, Catan covered this um, on uh, on Sunday, I believe, and it starts out with negative selfish relationships, unlike positive ones or or positive relationships of concern are another form of intolerance. Now, if you remember intolerance, uh, turn over to page 24 real quick. We'll just look at this. Uh-oh, went too far. Page 24. And if you look at that page, it says um, an equation of hate. It starts out with intolerance. Intolerance is unwilling to accept any person and unwilling to help them overcome things that are not beneficial. Then plus with inconsiderate, displaying a lack of thoughtful concern for others. Then plus racism, the mistreatment of a group of people due to nationality or ethnicity. And then discrimination, which is the treatment or consideration based on class or category rather than individual merit. You know, it's partiality and prejudice. It all equals hate, which is an intense hostility and extreme dislike. And these words are part of our vocabulary because of a lack of acceptance. Now back to page 55. So they can tear you down by devaluing your worth. And any relationship where you are abused verbally, physically, or emotionally, or sexually is negative. And and remember that verbally and emotionally. I mean, we think a lot about an abusive relationship being one where somebody's getting hit in the face or something, you know. But remember, being abused abused verbally, um, I remember there was was a um, kind of a a cartoon that uh, uh, showed what it was like to abuse someone verbally. In fact, it said that, that... it hurts more than even the physical hurt. And it showed a fist coming out of the person's mouth, you know. And it really does. Ver- verbal abuse stays with somebody. Verbal abuse and emotional abuse stays with people like all their life. While, while they might get over, uh, 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 you know, a bruise physically or... Uh, something like that, the, the verbal and emotional abuse can last an entire lifetime. And, of course, the sexual abuse, too. These types of relationships can cause serious psychological damage, fear, and distrust. And one example of a negative relationship is the bullying. In elementary and middle schools, bullying has caused problems that range from low self-worth worth to violence and physical aggression. Often people accept being abused or bullied because they think it will help them fit in with the crowd and be accepted. Now, children, listen to this. Again, people sometimes accept the being abused or bullied because they think it will help them fit in with the crowd and be accepted. That's not the right thing. You should never, never go along with that. Or they think it's okay if their friends mistreat or abuse them. No, it's not okay. Be aware of anyone who uses violent acts such as hitting, pushing, name-calling, and then claims to be only joking. Being picked on, teased, and physically abused are not things to laugh about. Adults get involved in this, but children seem to get involved in it quite a bit without really knowing what they're getting into. They, They think they're having fun, or at least the one doing the bullying at the time. And don't, uh, you know, don't, don't, um, don't retaliate. Don't fight back with the bully. You need to find an authority and let them know what's going on. Ask for help. Okay, well, now we're going to be starting where Catan left off there on the last paragraph. It says, here's the bottom line. Abusive relationships are not funny, and it is not the way people with a positive moral character would treat others. Allowing yourself to be abused will not help you to fit in. So keep these words in mind when we're going throughout the week. We, you know, teachers, uh, learning to be teachers of the peaceful solution, students of the peaceful solution, 
Let's remember these words. Abusive relationships are not funny, and it is not the way people with positive moral character would treat others. Now, we always want to be that example of doing the right thing. We always want to be the example of, of the positive moral character in how we treat others. The peaceful solution, though, keep in mind, is not an excuse to let things go, to not correct a situation. It's also not an excuse to not talk to an authority. If there's a problem, and so, someone's having a problem, you can be their friend and be an example showing positive moral character if you find an authority that can help out with that problem. I know in the past sometimes people have used the word snitch, you know, something like that, when, when they know there's a situation taking place and they say, oh no, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'd be a snitch. Well, you've got to get that word out of your vocabulary. That is nothing positive. That's a negative word. How could you possibly help a friend in need that's having a problem that possibly uh, an authority figure could help out with, you know, and talk? they could talk with them and help them through that situation? How would you be helping by not saying anything about it? You're not. So, didn't mean to get too far off into that, but, but by being an example of using and putting to work in your life positive moral character on how you treat others and yourself, you've got to remember these things. I, I hope that was clear. Allowing yourself to be abused will not help you to fit in. It will only make you a victim. If this is occurring to you, use the following suggestions to help you deal with your situation appropriately. So don't downplay or ignore abusive treatment. All that will do is cause you to hold a grudge. It'll, it'll cause it to build, and you'll be hanging on to it, and you'll be like the guy that drinks a glass of poison waiting for someone else to die. It doesn't work. It only hurts you if you're holding a grudge. Talk to someone you trust who will listen and recognize how serious your situation is. And then, never try to retaliate or get even. People with moral character will handle even the worst situation in a positive way. And that's what, that's what we're learning and what we want to get across to our students. We want to impart this knowledge of how to do these things. But, you know, knowledge without action is kind of useless. You can, you can have the knowledge, but you've got to put it to work in your life. You have to use it. You can read this whole book and every peaceful solution book there is and set it up on the shelf and, you know, wait till next time you get ready to read it. And it doesn't work that way. You really have to put it to work in your life. So every day you should be looking at, yeah, you know, how did I do? At the end of the day, hmm, man, oh, I remember what I did, you know, and try to correct the situation. Okay, let's go back to, uh, let's see, LP3E, I believe it is, Lesson Plan 3E. And let's take a look again. Well, we already looked at uh, procedure number seven. We've completed that. Let's go on to procedure number eight. It says to explain to students that hostile and devaluing interactions are a form of intolerance. I think we've pretty well covered that at this point. But intolerance in any form has the potential to create conflicts b between people. It has the potential. It doesn't have to, but it, it will when you, know, you open your mouth or take some action that shows forth that intolerance. Healthy interactions convey an attitude of acceptance because the healthy interactions are ones that are positive where you have at least two parties working together to have a positive relationship. So you're accepting one another. You're accepting one another for who you are, not, not, uh, not worried about the color of someone's skin or their nationality or you know, whether, whether they you know, absolutely like exactly the same things you like or not. You know, you're willing to, to, um, to listen. 
You know, you're willing to show forth empathy. Uh, and I didn't say sympathy. Sympathy is when you, you, you know, you agree with somebody on their situation too, um, or on their opinions. You know, you got to watch what you're sympathetic to. But we can always show empathy. And, and you know, that's like, that's like being able to walk in another person's shoes for a while, to, to understand where they're from, where they've been, what they've experienced. It might be far worse than what you've experienced. On the other hand, what you've experienced in other areas may be far worse than what they have. So you work together to have a positive relationship. You know, keeping that in mind, not locking down on, on just because you didn't do it that way. That's the only way to do it is what you think. No, there are other ways to do things that still accomplish positive end results. So you have to have an open mind and be empathetic, have true care and concern for the other person. That's what a positive relationship is all about. <clears throat> so if people do uh, relate to you in an intolerant way, you can't really allow yourselves to remain a victim of this. You know, again, you've got to get that out. You've got to talk to somebody. Um, seek some care from someone that you, that you trust and that can deal with you positively because you don't want to be, be caught holding on to a grudge. And what we're going to do now in procedure number nine, we're going to conclude this lesson by going over the section entitled what I have learned, and that's found on page 57 uh, of our handbooks. Now, page 56, I'm sorry, we're going go, to go to page 56 there. Um, the, um, the negative selfish relationships hurt, uh, and we're going to look at the scenarios briefly on page 56 before moving on to page 57. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, go to page 56. Now, Sheila and her friend Val were discussing how to spend their afternoon. Well, I want to go to the mall. My mom is going, and she said she would be glad to take us, said Val. Well, I don't feel like going to the mall, responded Sheila. I know. How about the library? What a stupid idea, said Val. Who in their right mind would want to spend the afternoon in the library? Well, based on this discussion, would you classify Sheila and Val's relationship as positive or negative? Well, of course, it's negative. So some of the reasons why, you know, uh, Val's criticism of Sheila is likely to, or her ideas, is likely to hurt her feelings, you know, make her feel embarrassed or so forth. And, and like I said before, people don't always agree on what they want to do. But you have to be open to it and not cut somebody else down just because they want to do something you don't want to do. You, you work together. You compromise. Let's go to number two. Mark desperately needed to borrow his brother's baseball for practice. But his brother, Jer Jeremy, was not at home. Mark decided to take the baseball, use it, and return it before his brother got home. You know... Uh, I have a question right there. I, I, I always wonder sometimes on the scenarios as we start reading, you know, why didn't Mark already have a baseball for practice? If he knew he was going to have practice, why didn't he already have that situation taken care of or have his own ball? But anyway, Mark decided to take the baseball, use it, and return it before his brother got home. However, during practice, Mark hit the ball out of the park and into the lake. Having no other choice, he had to tell his brother that he had taken the ball without permission. I wonder how he did that. I wonder if he told him that he like hit a home run or something first, you know, and then, uh-oh, but it went into the lake. So anyway, he tells his brother, and after listening, Jeremy patiently explained, look, being brothers does not give you the right to go into my room and take whatever you want. I need to know that I can trust you to respect my belongings, just like I respect yours. Mark apologized and offered to use his next allowance to buy a new baseball for Jeremy. So did Mark's brother communicate his feelings appropriately? Well, yeah. Yeah, he did. He told him matter-of-factly that, hey, you know, I, I respect your belongings. I'd like you to respect mine. You can't keep doing this. 
but he didn't call him names or put him down or anything. How did Jeremy's response enable the situation to be resolved appropriately? Well, by treating his brother with respect, you know, he was able to, by, um, by, by his brother treating him with respect, um, uh, his brother was able to apologize and work out a solution, which is, you know, getting him another ball, replacing the ball, which is the right thing to do, of course. So sometimes the scenarios will make you think about things, you know, and that's what they're there for. Those aren't the only things that could possibly occur to show disrespect or, or, uh, or you know, a, a negative relationship, a negative communication, or a positive. That's not the only situation there is. I'm sure sometime this week, if we all thought about it, we could probably think back about a negative, you know, a negative uh, uh, scenario that occurred in our lives or even a positive one that occurred in our lives. And we could look back and see, now what went wrong? Just like we're doing in the scenarios. That's what these are for, to get us to think about things. You know, it asks the question, how do you think, you know, like in the first one, how do you think Val's response made Sheila feel? Well, we can be thinking, you know, how did my response help uh, Michael to feel? Or how did my response help been to feel something like that you know how how did it how did it work did I really do right or did I communicate properly that's what this is all about so think about it that's what that page is there for put your own you know put your own scenario there on something that occurred in your life you know okay so Again, in Procedure 9, I already mentioned it, uh, we're going to go to What I've Learned, found on page 57. And uh, the healthy interactions result from positive communication with ourselves and others. This is back on Lesson Plan 3, sorry about that, 3E. Healthy interactions, when nurtured, have the potential to develop into strong relationships that encourage us and help us to grow as moral individuals. That's because we'll have other people helping us to do that, too. When you have positive relationships, then those relationships, you know, you work together to, I've heard it said that iron sharpens iron, you know, so we work together to, to grow. We work together to get past our difficulties and our, our differences of opinion and so forth. And we work towards these positive relationships. Let's go ahead and turn on over to page 57 now. And we'll start out with number one. Communication is the basis for our interactions. Now, before I say what page it's on that I'm going to cover, some of you might already have some notes as to what page is covered. Or you might think about it for a moment and think, wow, what pages were talked about there? Did that talk about? But I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I'm going to page 44, and you can follow along if you like. <clears throat> so on page 44, communication is the basis for our inter interaction. And at the top of the page, the title is Interaction and Communication. Interaction simply means the way we affect and influence each other. So the way we affect one another, the way we influence one another. And, and i got to tell you, we're probably going to talk about influences before this is over with tonight, too. It's so important. You, you, you won't, it, it's hard to have a positive relationship with anybody if you're letting negative influences come into your, your mind and into your heart. If you're letting these negative influences in because they, they might be, the, the negatives might be the, uh, against the very things you're trying to improve upon. Um, you know, there's lots of music out there that's very negative communication, very negative influences. And they call each other names and, um, you know, they say bad things about each other. And, and a, a lot of this music is that way. And if you have that going on in your life, you're letting these influences come in. It's going to be really hard to form positive relationships with people when you have these negatives uh, building up on one side. So interaction simply means the way we affect and influence each other. 
Our most important means of interaction is, of course, communication. We communicate with each other both verbally and physically. Sharing our thoughts and feelings with each other is the basis of our communication. See that? Sharing our thoughts and feelings. And everybody doesn't have the same thoughts and feelings. Even, you know, positive, positive thoughts. I hope, it, I hope everybody's having the same positive thoughts and feelings about the peaceful solution and about building positive relationships. But sometimes thoughts, you know, are a little bit different. You know, you, you think this room would look great painted blue, and I think it would look uh, great painted green. You know, so we're thinking a little differently about that. You know, no problem. So sharing our thoughts and feelings with each other is the basis of our communication. And could you imagine being joyful, sad, upset, or scared, and having no way to share that information with anyone? I mean, you're just, you're just sitting there. Blank look on your face. Blank verbal communication. No words to explain exactly as you feel. You would sound like a robot, possibly. I don't know. I have no thought on the matter. So, see how silly that would be? I mean, you wouldn't be able to smile. You know, smiling... You, you show forth, you know, one feeling, you know, in, in, in your thoughts. If you were sad. I mean, could you imagine not being able to communicate or have, and, and even have the words to do so? Imagine not being able to use your facial expressions, hands, or body gesture, you know, with your mouth to speak with. You know, some people have to slow it down sometimes, you know. But it, it comes in handy. You know, it gets the message out there, right? Picturing this gives us an appreciation for the, the ability to communicate and the importance it plays in our lives. It really does. I know I've uh, uh, been on the, on the Internet before uh, looking for some information on how to do a certain thing. And what a difference it is when you have someone they're showing you in the video exactly how to do it and talking while they're, you know, taking the widget and applying it here or gluing it down or screwing it in with a screw gun or whatever, and they're speaking about it as doing it instead of having an animated cartoon with a robotic voice showing you. You know, that, that occurs sometimes. And it's, it's just a massive difference, you know. So, all about the words now. Words are powerful. They convey our needs, our thoughts, our feelings, and consequently, our character. The words you speak can either show care and concern, or they can embarrass, threaten, and frighten others. And I, I can't remember if it was Catan or, um, or uh, William, but um, I remember someone speaking about how you could even get thrown in jail for opening your mouth and saying something to somebody like, you know, even something like, I'm going to beat you up, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You, you could get thrown in jail for that. Uh, terroristic threatening, I believe, is what it's called in some places. So in other words, whether you're honest or compassionate, deceitful or selfish, these are all indicated by the words you choose when communicating and interacting with others. Verbal and written communication are important aspects of how we interact with others. The more words you're familiar with, the better you will be able to clearly express yourselves. So we're talking about having a, a, a vocabulary also. So as we grow up as a child, you know, people learn a lot of the same basic words. And we learn what we think is the definition of those words. You know, it's funny as you get older and you start looking at some of those words in the dictionary you find out how little you really knew. Some of the words mean drastically different things than we were taught when we were growing up. It's amazing. You should, you should check it out sometimes. Just pick a few words and go to the dictionary and check it out. But occasionally grabbing a new word, increasing your vocabulary so that you'll be able to express yourself properly and exuberantly. Effectively using words when you speak and write will lessen opportunities for misunderstandings and miscommunication. 
So the next time you're given vocabulary words, study them and try to incorporate them into your everyday conversations. It's not that easy. When you're learning a new word, you really got to practice. You, you've got to, you've got to, uh, to use it every possi possible time you can think of using it. You know, you got to be consistent in doing so, and eventually it will grow into being part of your new um, vibrant uh, vocabulary. Let's look at the little cloud there at the bottom. The average person learns to speak when he's about two years of age, but words have been influence, influencing us even before we were born. That's right. Before the invention of the telephone, writing letters was the only means of communicating over distances. I don't know if any of us in here are old enough to remember those days, but uh, I think there was at least a, t a telephone, a wall telephone or something available. <laughs> Um, for most of us. Let's go on back to page um, 57, I believe it is. Page 57. Okay, our next point is that positive communication with others involves using words respectfully and having appropriate facial expressions and body language. Using words respectfully and having appropriate facial expressions and body language. Let's go to page 45. And there's some other pages that, that cover some of it here, but 45 pretty well handles this. Okay, um, one thing to remember, a little note I have at the top of the page, is that the tone of how something is said can change the definition. Got it? The tone of how something is said can change the definition. Well, let's look at the little pictures there at the top. It's like the young man. He's standing there. He's got his head down, kind of slumping a little bit. I'm not sad. Really, really, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, that's not, uh, for those of you that don't have it, you got to see this, you know. Okay, so there's the young man. He's got kind of a sad face there and slumping down and uh, he says I'm not sad really I'm fine you know well what would you think if you were there you would know that he was really sad right and that that the words he was saying really didn't matter everything's changed when you're looking at how his body language and his tone of voice and everything is is uh, coming at you and uh, here's another one this one he's ready to fight and he says uh, I said I'm not angry. <laughs> He's ready to fight. I said I'm not angry. So, you know, if you were standing there talking to the guy, uh, you, you would quickly think, you know, let me, let me get away from here. <laughs> you know, this guy's, this guy's out of control. Uh, <clears throat> so, it's how you say it. Did anyone ever tell you they were not angry, but by the way they said it, you knew they were? Did you ever tell someone you were fine, but they could tell that you were not being honest about your feelings? As, in, as important as words are, our tone of voice, our facial expressions, and body language help to convey our true feelings. It's not just what we say, you know, our words. It's how we say it, our tone of voice, how we look and act when we're saying it, our facial expression and our body language. And... I don't know, I'm smiling a lot tonight uh, about this, you know, because I, I really do like this. I, I find it very interesting how, how there's two, you know, a couple of different ways of saying things like that, of how you can look somebody in the eye and say, you're one of my best friends. You know, well, well what would you think if I said it to you like that? You'd probably go away wondering... Oh, his best friends, what was that all about, you know? Uh, so the communication is very interesting that, um, uh, you know, the, the hand gestures, the smiling, the, the, the body language, the posture, all of that comes into play. And I know in, uh, I've been to it through a few speech classes as well as some of you have, and we know that those things make a difference. Okay, 
So it's not just what we say, our words, and how we say it, our tone of voice, and, and how we look and act when we're saying it. That's our facial expression and body language. Our tone of voice reflects the emotional intent behind our words. Now, this is where the definition can change. Our tone of voice reflects the emotional intent behind our words. For example, when you're angry, your voice has a harder edge and will usually increase in volume. And if you're really angry, it's really kind of hard to control that. If you're, if you're already at the point that you're a little bit out of control, you're probably not going to be controlling your tone of voice and everything to where, you, to where you're uh, smiling and, and, and you know, speaking uh, uh, softly to the person. But when we say the words, I love you, we say it with a softer voice, or, or when we say those, and, and in a carry, carrying way. If we're sad, our voices are usually lowered, less energetic, and might have a quality of despair. And remember, it's always on our face. Our facial expressions also help to convey our true feelings. Have you ever heard the old saying, actions speak louder than words? Well, yeah, that's something to remember, too. Again, you know, about being an example, an example of positive moral character. Our actions speak louder than words. People see you. They're watching. They're listening to you. And it's, it's, it's important to remember, too, as, as a teacher, you know, people are not only looking at you, they look up to you. They put the teacher on a bit of a pedestal, a position of honor. And so when you do something that is that doesn't go along with, with positive moral character and keeping this peaceful solution, it's gonna hurt it's gonna hurt them more than if it were like for say another student. It's gonna hurt when they see you just do something. So we need to really keep that in mind. Our emotions act out scenes on our faces. Have you ever looked at someone and knew that they were bored, joyful, sad, angry? Oh yeah, we all have. Well, these, along with many other emotions, can be clearly read and understood through our facial expressions. And of course, it gives a picture here, a uh, few pictures here at the bottom of people that uh, different emotional states Let's go on back to page 57, please. And let's look at uh, point number three. Now, even our ability to listen improves, well, my ability to listen improves my interactions with others. My, my ability to listen improves my interactions with others. I think it's been said before, that's why we have, you know, two ears and one mouth. Who hasn't, who's never heard that before? Anybody? Okay, we all have. So we, so we have two ears and one mouth, right? So our ability to listen improves our interactions with others. Let's turn to page uh, 48. Page 48, uh, at the top it says, Listening is a skill that those who are wise will practice. You know, wise is when you have the knowledge and know how to implement that knowledge. Listening is a skill that those who are wise will practice, develop, and nurture. Someone who is wise is quicker to listen than to speak. Listening helps us communicate. So, learn to listen. Did you know that listening is also one of the ways in which we communicate? That's right. Communication is more than just talking. We show our acceptance of others and our willingness to interact positively when we take the time to really listen to what others have to say. Believe it or not, listening is not as simple as it seems, especially in these days with telephones. You know, you're trying to intently listen to somebody and you, you think they're done. You know, you can't see their face or anything, right? You can't see uh, what's going on. And you start to speak just to find out that you just cut them off. Oh, no. And you're like, okay, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> so it, it makes it a little more difficult with these telephones sometimes. It sure is easier when you're standing in front of the person and can see their, their facial features, their, their body language, and so forth. But when we take the time to really listen to what others have to say. 
So believe it or not, listening is not as simple as it seems. Listening is actually a very important skill that has to be practiced. So here's a couple things you should never take for granted. Well, the ability to hear and also the ability to listen. Hearing is one of the five senses that most of us are born with. Those who are born unable to hear or have limited hearing due to illness or even accidents communicate by sign language or by reading lips. Therefore, those of us who can hear should learn to listen to the best of our ability. Of course, the little cartoon says, hear one, hear all. Um, look over at page 49. So know that listening is a choice. When we really listen to people, we not only hear their words, but also their tone of voice. In addition, we observe their facial expressions and their body language. In other words, we listen with our ears, our eyes, and our hearts. And what's that called? It's called listening with empathy. Listening with empathy. Now, empathy, of course, is to you know understand how others feel, you know, walk a mile in their shoes, etc. You know, understand what they've been through and so forth. Um, but listening with emp empathy simply means to listen to gain a true understanding of what you're being told. It means putting yourself in the other person's shoes and walking that mile with them. Not only is listening a choice, but it's an effective skill that will serve you well into your future. To really listen to someone requires having the right attitude also. You must want to hear and understand what that person is, is saying so that there can be no misunderstandings. And this requires like your, your full attention too. Here's a few points to remember when listening. Do repeat the intent of their words in order to ensure understanding of what's being said. For example, your friend might say, my sister makes me mad because she always ignores me when her friends are around. To show that you're listening, that you want to hear what she's saying, you might respond with, sounds as if you feel left out when your sister treats you that way. That type of response is called a reflective response. You can actually, it reflects what they're feeling, and you can actually get some... Uh, uh, um, you can actually un understand the person a little bit better and, 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 and they, can under they will understand that you're wanting to understand them better. Do encourage them to speak by using encouraging phrases such as, really? Oh, did you have fun? Wow. <laughs> Do listen with appropriate body language. Lean forward, have a relaxed posture. Don't stand with your hands on your waist or with your arms crossed. People, that gives the person, people the wrong impression because a lot of people think that that automatically means that you're blocking off anything that's being said. That's not always the case. Do maintain appropriate eye contact. It doesn't mean staring at someone and making them feel uncomfortable. Number five, don't interrupt what someone is saying just to give your opinion. And number six, don't change the subject in the middle of their talk with you unless the conversation is inappropriate. And that's a great skill to learn also. If there's inappropriate things being said, you can correct it and make the other person think just merely by changing the entire conversation. It takes a little practice, but this shows you have no interest in what's being said. Uh, well, it says don't change the subject in the middle of a talk with you unless it's inappropriate. Um, because if you do, it shows that you have no interest in what's being said, and it's also rude. If it is inappropriate, that's when you would want to do such a thing, and it acts as a form of correction also. Let's go on back to page uh, 57. I'm trying to pack it all in here. All right. Body language can send messages just as loudly if I were speaking. Body language can send messages just as loudly as if I were speaking. And um, we can go to page uh, 46 there. Page 46. So there's a, uh, something to read there about body language. 
Before sound was incorporated into film, the public relied on the actors and actresses to portray their feelings by their facial expressions and body language. There's still a form of entertainment which relies exclusively on one's ability to in in interpret communication through expressive body or facial expression, and this is called pantomime. Body language is another way we communicate our needs and feelings to others. Have you ever noticed that if people are sad, they slouch? If they're angry, they, their bodies become tense, and they, may, they might have clenched fists or tight jaws. On the other hand, when people are in a great mood, they're relaxed, they smile, and, and even the way they walk is cheerful and kind of bouncy. If you're observant, you can tell all these things about people by watching their body language. It's normal for us to read that body language. Some of the examples given earlier are actually examples of that. <clears throat> but to carry it further, you know, uh, a manager in a company might be a little, a little better trained at, uh, in dealing with employees on, on learning how to read body language, all types of body language, face, facial features and, and so forth, uh, gestures, um, all these things. I know, um, you know, if you could think of some of these agencies like CIA, FBI, NSA, <laughs> uh, the local sheriff's department, the local police department, whatever, all of these folks are trained in reading body language. Some do it better than others, some put it to use more than others, but they're, they're trained a little bit more than the average individual on this. So on our next page, page 47, be careful of the messages you send. People can use their body language to attract members of the opposite sex. Uh, boys usually show their interest in a particularly girl, uh, particular girl by acting like macho, you know, tough and cool and all that. Puff out their chests and flex their muscles and so forth. And, and then girls, on the other hand, tend to dress a certain way that... Uh, uh, we're not saying that that's right by any means. We're just explaining that this is how these things uh, take place sometimes. So be careful of these messages that you send with your body language because it says a lot about your character. What you're communicating when you try to encourage a member of the opposite sex to pay attention to you. What, what is it you're communicating? Consider what you're saying about yourself when you walk and dress in a way that's meant to turn heads. And people have been known to acquire negative reputations because of these things. And in previous lessons, we've talked about reputation and how important it is. Keep in mind that body language is visible to all who can see. Okay? Be careful of the messages you send with your body. They can be read loud and clear. Let's go back to page 57. The next point is positive communication leads to healthy interaction, and strong relationships. Positive communication leads to healthy interactions and strong relationships. And if we could go back to page 53, I think that will, will help us with that. So building these strong relationships. And remember, this is a, a, an age-old quote right here by the Peaceful Solution. It's one of the first things we learn is, don't give respect to get respect. You give respect because it's the right thing to do. You owe respect to everybody, whether they're showing you respect or not. This is quite different, especially for those of y'all out there listening tonight, it's quite different than what you might see on posters from different character education uh, programs, or it might be quite different than what you've learned from your teachers and, and even from your parents and friends and everything all your life. Because the, the common thing is, oh, you gotta, you got to give respect to get respect. Or, or, you know, when you get respect, you give respect. You know, it's always, okay, are you giving it first or getting it first? But just remember, giving respect is the right thing to do, and you owe it to everybody. Always show respect. Building relationships. A relationship is built when mu mutual interaction connects two or more people as belonging or working together. Although there are many types of relationships, they all result from communication and interaction, which is what we've been talking about here tonight, and, and the past several nights, actually. Some relationships are personal, while others are professional. 
A personal relationship involves two or more people who know each other well and are comfortable around each other. Now, in that situation, you're going to readily know a person's body language and, you know, if they're sad or not or if they're joyful or not. And, you know, you've had a long time to, to, to learn about them and learn all their quirks and, and, and so forth. The relationships that you share with family or close friends are examples of personal relationships. A professional relationship is more formal. For example, the relationships you share with your teachers or boss are examples of professional relationships. Um, so this was mentioned uh, in a recent class too. You wouldn't uh, go up to your the, the CEO of the company you work for. You know, you're walking by or he's taking a tour of the company and you're there working. You turn around and say, "Hey, dude, how's it going?" You know, or to the principal of your school, you wouldn't just say, dude, what's going on? You know, you're not going to do that. That's a more formal relationship. You probably wouldn't want to do that with, with just about anybody, but, but definitely not with someone in authority, for instance. You're going to, to uh, if your principal is Mr. Jones, you're going to say, oh, uh, hello, Mr. Jones, how are you today? Or, you know, you're going to respond quite differently. And, you know, of course, there's rules everywhere. Whether you're aware of it or not, all relationships, both professional and personal, have rules and guidelines that govern this behavior and interaction. Um, many workplaces and schools have a code of conduct. you got to remember, it covers verbal and physical respect for others at, most time, at all times. Um, um, in relationships such as those between teacher and student or doctor and patient, these are professional. And there's some rules that kind of govern these things. When the rules that govern personal relationships are compromised, the result is also abuse that could range from ver uh, verbal to physical and sexual. Sexual behavior between family members, for example, is not only immoral, but it's also devastating to everybody involved. And it violates the bond of trust that must exist, too. That, that would not be a positive relationship. So there's rules that govern relationships. And we're talking about those rules all throughout the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. Let's go back to page uh, 57 for a moment. Well, you know, hold on. Go back to page 54 for just a minute, because at, at the bottom... At the bottom, the bottom half, um, when people mutually follow the rules governing relationships and interact with consideration and concern, true respect, they are forming positive relationships. Positive relationships are respectful and motivate you to make moral choices, fulfill your need to be ex accepted and to belong, and allow you to politely voice your opinions, likes, and dislikes. Positive relationships play an important role in determining whether you develop a moral or negative behavior. So be conscientious to treat others fairly and with respect. It takes a lot of work and you got to be you work at it consistently. This shows value for life and that you have a positive moral character. Okay, let's go back here to uh, page 57 and look at the last point there. Understanding positive and the negative moral relationships will enable you to make wise choices that will help you to avoid being mistreated by others. Well, um, on page 55, if you look there, it talks about the negative selfish relationships that hurt, and this is the thing that we want to avoid. So understanding the positive moral relation relationships will help you to make wise choices that will help you avoid being mistreated by others. In, in many different ways, we can control a lot of how others treat us by how we interact with them, too. Uh, if you start out your interaction with somebody positively, showing them respect with a smile on your face, it's really kind of hard for them to come back in a, in a terrible, angry way. On the other hand, if, if we are not conducting ourselves appropriately, it would be very easy to get somebody to come back at us in an angry, inappropriate way and creating a negative 
relationship rather than a positive. I would like you just briefly, we've got just a moment. If you have your character unit, turn to page 79 real quick. Turn to page 79. I'd like you to remember uh, that in all of this, influences make a huge difference. These are influences. He's being bombarded by influences. Being bombarded by, uh, of course, there's positive influences in our life, and there's negative influences in our life. And so we really have to learn to keep those negative influences out and keep as many positive influences coming our way to be able to have these positive relationships, to be able to control ourselves and show respect to every individual every day, every time. You know, you got to work on it. It's, it's tough to do. Uh, so we need to, you can write this down on page 80 in your character unit. talks about setting our mind in advance, you know, being prepared on how we're going to deal with things, especially if we know we're going into a situation that in the past has proven to be tough for us to handle. And then remember on page 85, the curveballs and pitfalls that come our way. These things come when you least expect it. They, they come just out of the blue. So again, be ready. Be, be prepared for these things. And, and then lastly here, uh, page 88 talks about leaving yourself room to grow. So in all of this that we're talking about and learning the peaceful solution, learning to teach the peaceful solution, learning how to have positive relationships. You know, you're going to make mistakes along the way. So we have to remember to leave ourselves room to grow. Don't keep kicking yourself. Just realize what you did and uh, talk to somebody that you can trust about it. They can help you with it. And, and then determine in your mind, set your mind in advance that you're going to do it differently next time. That's having room to grow, okay? Don't kick yourself too much. Kick yourself a little bit, but get over it really quick and then learn from it, okay? And I'm really uh, glad everybody could show up here tonight. And our next class will be on, um, well, this coming uh, Sunday, which would be the um, 5th, Sunday the 5th. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sunday the 5th at 530. And so please attend again. Thank you.